Good evening, everyone. Uh, like our brochure said, we are going to be starting the event at around 625 with introductions. So right now, feel free to either chat amongst yourselves. Um, and George will be joining us for or uh, George will be introducing everybody starting at around 625. Uh, thank you guys again for coming to the first Vertical Flight Society Southwest chapter webinar and we'll uh, start uh, giving you some more information in a little bit. Just to let everybody know, I have uh, opened up your microphones. So if you wanna go off mute, you can talk amongst yourselves within the platform. Dr. Tischler and Dr. Lopez, this is Lane Merritt. Welcome to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> How are things in the AVMIC? Good. All as well. Did uh, did uh, you know? I don't know what um, what kinds of technologies um, your um, your company is, is is dealing with, but I uh, did anybody get a chance to uh, or uh, uh, take an interest in listening in on my uh, Nikolsky presentation? I know I did. Um, we do mostly mission systems, electronic stuff, and. Uh, Electro optical systems. I see. Um, we we plan to have a, a a big play for the HSA DM program when uh, when that starts up. I see. I'm retiring um, at the end of the calendar year. In fact, my uh, uh, formal retirement ceremony is next week. Oh wow! Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Tischler. This is Erasmo Pinheiro. Congratulations on on your contributions to our to our profession and thank you even more congratulations for the Nikolsky lecture too. that's a that's a great honor and and i'm looking forward to read the paper i'm sure you have done the paper already right <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'll be thinking about that on january the first i got a i got a whole stack of things uh to finish and uh the biggest one lane is uh but i think we're we're on track is uh we will have submitted our nato report and uh uh, uh and uh, uh the goal there was to get that submitted by the end of the calendar year which we will do and uh, we'll have a lecture series uh on on the topic of uh of simulation model fidelity assessment and improvement uh in a virtual lecture series where we're going to do you know, one of these world tours, but instead we'll we'll do uh, one in the European time zone and one in the North American time zone. All right. So, Becky, oh, begs the cool. question: uh, Is the uh, are they going to be publishing any agards, NATO agard uh, publications on on this type of uh, subject uh, that you know of? Because in the old days, that's what they used to do. They would like to encapsulate yeah. all that in a in a NATO agar. What do you know about yeah. that? Yeah, so 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 Agard. I was on an Agard. I was I was a, a U.S. panel member on on Agard, and it was a great organization. Um, and uh, they published uh, terrific Agard Agardographs. Um, the RTO also publishes uh, a very a, a very similar um, pendiums, and um, that is the product of our of our team. So we've been working for three years, uh, and um, I I I. I, I regularly thank Lane Merritt for getting me into this, but um, uh, uh, and convincing me that that was a good way to go. And, it, and in fact, it is. Uh, uh, and it is a the, really the only way of getting a multinational group together to to, to get work done. And um, and so we will publish a uh, a volume uh, that is uh, approaching uh, final uh, preparation. Uh, at the by end of the calendar year, and it'll be about simulation uh, fidelity uh, ass assessment metrics and uh, methods for improving uh, simulation fidelity. 
for rotocraft uh, strictly it's, it's uh, focused on on rotocraft fantastic we'll fantastic have, looking forward we'll to see that sir. thank Sorry, you so yeah. much for the update i really appreciate it sir sure and there are a lot of uh i i, I don't know lane who uh it seems, and this was true in the in the, in the Agar days, that the that the, um, the the publicity was never great, um, and so a lot of these working groups would go on, and lecture series would go on, and 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 it was almost like if you were connected right, you would see the announcements, but um, a lot of times you didn't know what you didn't know that these groups were going on. I know yeah, it's very true. sad, and if you look at the. Uh, at the different uh, representatives from different countries, especially Europe. I mean, it was the who is who of aeronautical engineering around the world. Uh, yes. All those agardographs and agards are, are basically classics in the aerospace literature. And I will encourage all the young members of our uh, profession to, to really go after these documents. Uh, some of them are available on the internet for downloads. But most of them are buried, are buried in big libraries like the Library of Congress or, or you know, places like that where nobody will ever look at them again. It's kind of a sad situation, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I was wondering, Lane. Uh, it just seems like it, like uh, so much of so much of it is word of mouth. Like they don't, they don't put out a call for papers for for a symposium, for example, in the open literature the way AHS does. It's all kind of done. Yeah, you're right. Down. It's all kind of internal to NATO, and if you're not in the group making connections, you never hear about it. You're right. And it was that way with Agard, actually. Uh, in fact, I I lobbied when I was a, a U.S. representative that it, it, we should have open call for papers because if uh, sometimes um, it, it was a misfire, it would be a topic that somebody was interested in, and 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 you you know basically if you knew somebody, you'd invite them to give a paper, but you, it, it wasn't always the A team that was giving the papers. So uh, it, it it varied. I mean, the the uh, Peter Hamel had, had you know the the flight mechanics uh, committee, which you know was Peter Hamel and Irv Statler, and I mean those th that was that was you know world 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 experts. Uh, but um, not every not every symposium was. Uh, it, some sometimes it was outside of their lane, uh, you know. And uh, um, it, yeah, I mean. Uh, I mean, the, the, the history of the Agar uh, meetings and the, the, the groups, the Agar groups, are, is a very, is a very uh, important one. And I, I would like to, to write a paper about that in the future, if I could. I, I do have a lot of the Agars in my library, and, and I feel like uh, it is something that needs to be, uh, the dust needs to be taken off them. And uh, th that technology hasn't grown old. No, uh, you know, that's you know, it hasn't. It hasn't. It's true. It's true. So anyway, we'll see what happens. Well, I get off the microphone now. I'm sorry about that. Um, you know, thank you guys. So Lane, I see uh Elbit just hired pretty pretty big name it's sean bond are you going to be involved oh, yeah. with, with him yes uh i've seen him on a few of the uh elt meetings that we have so uh, that's what we do these days but uh i look forward to meeting him in person soon we also just hired scott baum from uh, osd policy uh, industrial um policy Yeah, it's great. So I I used to work for Sean Bond, as did Mark. Yeah, he's like a good guy. Mark Hodge. Hodge is going to retire. He's really happy about that. Of course he is. <laughs> I'll be happy when I retire too. <laughs> I got enough hobbies now that work is getting in the way, but uh, yeah, I, guess I, I need to get, <laughs> get my retirement package set up first. Yeah. Yeah. Be sure. Be, be sure that the hobbies you be sure that the, that the cost of the toys uh, is, a, is an alignment with your uh, with your uh, retirement. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Windsurfers are cheap by comparison. Uh, you know, people that, that like sports cars or whatever. <laughs> Surfboards are cheap. While I'm still here, I'll just uh, say hi to Dave Downey. Oh, Dave. But particularly the retirement ceremony is going to be in uh, in NASA Ames. Uh, where is it going to be, loyal, sir? So it'll be at NASA Ames, and um, it'll be actually on the Army's uh, Facebook page. Anybody can anybody can see it. Uh, and um, there will only be 15 of us in a ballroom that seats. It's going to be Lane and then big NASA ballroom that seats 1,500. There'll be there'll be 15 souls. We'll each have a we'll each have a row to ourselves. And um, uh, so there'll be a very you know very few number of people in person, but it'll be streamed live um, on the on the on the, on the Army's Facebook page. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Can you? Uh Tell us the time and date, and I'm trying. To yeah, yeah. Watch I'll, it. I'll, 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 uh, Lane, I'll, 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 I'll get you the information. You can circulate it. Um, it's um, next Thursday at 2 p.m. Pacific. But I'll, I'll, um, uh, I have a link. Uh, but it's, it's, it's. Uh, um, I, I believe it's just the face. It's the army's. It's the admic, um, the admic page. Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, sir, uh, uh, we're not going to be there in person with you, but we wish you the best, of course, ahead of time. Thank you. Hey, Jim, just uh, if you're still with us, curious question. Um, I know it's you know, kind of doing a little preparation here and going back to looking at uh, the YouTube posting for Dr. Tischler's Nikolsky lecture. So I saw that, you know, they had over 2,300 views. So was that all all um, pretty primarily during the uh, the forum or, or has that been uh, views post, post the uh, live presentation? Well, I can tell you it was about half and half. Uh, because um, uh, people told me right after my presentation that there was, you know, uh, 1,200 or so uh, um, at the time. But there was also a Facebook page, so uh, there may have been others outside of YouTube. Uh, but um, I think that's one of the advantages, and I hope that in the future um, they'll not only have the person on stage, but they'll, all, they'll they can also stream it for people. I mean, if if they, they they made it available for free and 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 if they if they're willing to continue to do that i think it's terrific it, uh i mean a lot more people saw it than would have uh, uh under other circumstances on yeah. their own at their own time when it was convenient for them and 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 i mean it was a little it was a little strange for me uh, to be honest to be in a, a room alone looking at a camera and uh VFS uh, uh, staff saying three, two, one, you're live. Um, it's a strange <laughs> feeling. It's not what you uh, plan for, but but it actually worked very well. And they did a ter they, the VFS has done a terrific job. Uh, I thought they did a terrific job with form. Uh, really, the technology, even though it was their first try at it, I guess they had a lot of dry runs, and they I thought they did a terrific job. With it. Yeah, great. That's really appreciate the perspective there. Thank you. But I think it's. I think that um, there's no set rule about how long these things stay up on YouTube. So um, at least that's what the VFS said. That, that it's not up to them. That YouTube has some, you know, algorithm, and uh, I don't know what that means. If it's how many hits or how often or whatever. But uh, there's a there's a video uh, that was shot from a drone uh, two years ago. Um, uh, of, of me being rescued from the middle of the San Francisco Bay by uh, by the uh, by a fire rescue um, uh, um, uh, 
uh, they sent out two jet skis out, uh, uh, to, to, to pull me in from the middle of the San Francisco Bay. And that's still up online because evidently that's a that's that's a uh, that's a top ten uh, winner, you know. But um, so I don't think you have a lot of control over which which videos stay up and which don't. I'm not so sure. was that was that an unintended uh, YouTube uh, spectacular there, or or was that part of the? Well, whole, I, mean, I was uh, glad I, I was glad to see the drone overhead, but yeah, I I, I didn't uh, plan on getting stuck. Uh, Mother Nature uh, turned the wind turned the wind off before I could get in. <laughs> okay. And there's no engine on a, on a windsurfer, so uh, I could either uh, paddle in. I, I was swimming, and uh, and uh, the drone came in overhead, and it turned out that it was the uh, fire rescue that sent their somebody had spotted me, and they sent the drone out and uh, got my coordinates, and then they sent two jet skis after me and pulled me in, which was great. Uh, great technology, and and uh, sometimes when I teach a class and talk about you know UAVs and say, look, you know, there's you know there are there are outstanding uh you know uses for, for you know for these vehicles uh, yeah that is that's really yeah we're <laughs> no better experience than uh real life experience there right uh but yeah yeah, really. yeah it was um uh, I, I was real happy when that went i mean i saw this uh, it was a, clearly a uh, commercial grade UAV. It was very bulky and a large camera, uh, and they were and it was in uh, they were just hovering, you know, 100 feet over my head and, and like they like it was a nail in the sky. But what's strange to me was they didn't have a microphone. I, I was sure that they, you know, they would be able to talk to me, and I was waving my hand saying, "Yeah, come pick me up." And I was giving them the sign, you know, the 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 international sign for for being in stress, and they they figured out from that to send the to send the jet skis out. But I I would have thought they would have had a microphone on the thing to talk to me, and they didn't. That was probably an extra thousand dollar option. <laughs> Just like that airplane, huh? Yeah, yeah, it probably was. The funny thing about that video is um, you can find it on YouTube if you look up um, Windsurfer Rescue by Jet Ski, you, um, you'll find it on YouTube. And, and you, ha you have to know what you're looking for, but um, there's, there's a small jump in the video where, where, uh, where it looks like they, they cut out a small piece. And they did because, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the lifeguards were big and, 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 and hulking uh, guys, of course. and, and um, uh, and uh, when they pulled me up, uh, and the, but the waves were quite large in the middle of the bay, and um, they uh, uh, they were crosswise to the waves. And uh, when they pulled me up onto the jet ski, they got hit by a wave, and, and we rolled the jet ski over, and, and we all went in the water. And they cut that out because it didn't, it wasn't really good for their publicity. That uh, you know they had a poor drowning windsurfer, and they dumped me back in the water again. And, and, uh, <laughs> so. So, so that part's cut out of the video. So if you watch it, you, all of a sudden you'll see a jump and you'll go, oh, what happened there? <laughs> Bad for the PR. Lane, have you moved uh, entirely to to um, to the Texas area and 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 uh, bought a house down there and everything? Are you fully relocated? Yep, we're fully re relocated. We have some uh, adult children left over in Alabama, but they're on their own. I see. Okay.
So um, just so I know, um, um, will it be seminar style and then the question and answers are at the end? Do you want me to uh, um, to moderate the Q&A or um, just do the introductions? And, and, and how do you want me to, what, what do you want me to say about the Q&A? Uh, um, yeah, Dr. Tischler, um, I had planned to, you know, kind of thank the presenters and then uh, open it up for Q&A. So uh, if you're comfortable moderating that, we can uh, do that. Or, or uh, we had kind of planned to, to monitor it between the officers and I. So yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I mean, if I have a question, I can I can jump in too. But uh, um, but you want to hold the questions to the end, I guess is uh, uh, we. That was the plan, and I guess I'll defer to our speakers. If you know, are you would you prefer that, or comfortable taking questions as they yeah, come in? I prefer to do it at the end. Okay, we'll okay. do it at the end. Okay, so it looks like uh, about five minutes till. So I'll go ahead and go live with the video here. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. Well, uh, hopefully all are seeing the uh, presentation still. The Southwest chapter, welcome. Okay, good. All right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, begin the intros for the evening. So, uh, hello and welcome uh, to everyone uh, to the first ever Vertical Flight Society Southwest Chapter hosted webinar. Uh, tonight we are featuring a presentation on the Bell V280 application of joint input output methodology for hover model identification by uh, Bell Control Law Engineer Ms. Caitlin Berrigan and U.S. Army Aerospace Engineer Dr. Mark Lopez. Thank you for joining us. My name is George Havrilla, and I am the Vertical Flight Society Southwest Chapter President. I'm joined this evening by fellow Southwest Chapter Leadership, uh, Chapter Vice President, Mr. Carl Culling, and STEM Chair, Dr. Elizabeth Ward. Um, reviewing the attendees, I don't see anybody else yet, so I'll certainly keep an eye for them. But uh, thank you to Carl and uh, Elizabeth for joining. Also wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge our support this evening by the Vertical Flight Society national staff members, Mr. Jim Sherman, uh, Director of Strategic Development, and Chris Thompson, uh, VFS staff member. Finally, uh, if you've uh, been listening into the preview here, we're also joined by a special guest, Dr. Mark Tischler. Dr. Tischler's was uh, this year's recipient of the Alexander A. Nikolsky Honorary Lectureship. Um, before I hand over speaker introduction duties to Dr. Tischler, I wanted to address a few notes about the format and use of the GoToWebinar Go to platform, as well as a few updates about the chapter. So this evening, if you do have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box uh, on the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll have uh, time for questions at the end uh, of the presentation. Um, both Carl and Elizabeth and, uh, and Dr. Tischer, uh, Tischler and I for, uh, will be uh, assisting uh, in the monitoring of those questions uh, and the discussion board. So uh, concerning uh, Southwest chapter news items, um, we are accepting abstract uh, submissions for uh, the 2021 Robert L. Lichten Award competitions. Abstracts are due to me, George Havrilla, by next Thursday, November 19th. Uh, the competition is currently is scheduled for Monday, December 7th, and will be hosted at Bell's Fort Worth headquarters. Despite what communication you may have received, these dates are for this year, 2020, not 2021. Uh, 
competitors will present via a virtual platform. And uh, we're actually using and, and awaiting the results from this evening's presentation to, to determine the platform for that effort. We will also be uh, beginning the process for um, uh, new chapter officer elections. Uh, the details for that effort are still in the early planning uh, stages. However, I did want to extend the invitation to all Southwest members to give consideration of a leadership role. If you are interested, please contact any of the officers list, listed on the screen. If you have any questions or comments about this information, again, please utilize the question box. So uh, going back a few months, as we were starting to firm up the details for this evening's pre presentation with our speakers, Ms. Berrigan and Dr. Lopez, we were uh, excited to learn of a connection with this year's uh, 40th annual uh, Nikolsky Lectureship uh, recipient, Dr. Mark Tischler. Uh, I'll provide a, just a brief synopsis of that connection. And it actually ties back to the Yellow Jackets of uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia, aka Georgia Tech. So that uh, collaboration began in the late 2000s uh, between Dr. Tischler, then at the University of Maryland, and Dr. J.P.R. Prasad of Georgia Tech. In 2011, Dr. Tischler joined Dr. Prasad at the Vertical Lift Research Center of Excellence. Uh, Dr. L Lopez, then a graduate student, became involved in uh, 2012 on an integrated flight and vibration control project under Dr. Tischler's mentorship, who later served on Dr. Lopez's doctoral dissertation committee. In 2015, Caitlin began work in Dr. Prasad's laboratory as an undergrad research student. Uh, Dr. Lopez helped to mentor Caitlin on how to use system identification to validate linear models. Upon graduation, Dr. Lopez began work at uh, DEFCOM Aviation and Missile Center, then known as the Aviation Development Directorate, in Dr. Tischler's Flight Control Group, a uh, collaboration which has continued to this day. In 2018, Caitlin began working uh, with Drs. Lopez and Tischler, representing the Bell B-280 group. And a collaboration initially started as an opportunity for a topic for Caitlin's master's thesis through the distance learning program at Georgia Tech, who the advisor was uh, Dr. Prasad. However, the uh, co collaboration scope of work uh, uh, has extended past the life of that initial project and they uh, continue to work together. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Tischler. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor to, uh, uh, to present uh, uh, this uh, uh, collaborative effort. Um, uh, the U.S. Army uh, has had collaborations uh, with the Textron family, both uh, Cessna and uh, Bell Helicopter for many years, uh, going back to um, uh, the ARH uh, helicopter, for example, and, and uh, Cessna on, uh, on some of their uh, advanced uh, flight control programs. Um, and um, so this is a product of one of those uh, collaborations. Uh, and so, it, so it's uh, terrific to be able to introduce them. Um, uh, Caitlin Berrigan uh, is the first author uh, and uh, Dr. Mark Lopez uh, uh, co-author, um, the paper's entitled uh, Bell V280 System Identification and Model Validation Using Flight Test Data, uh, with flight test data using the Joint Input Output Method. Uh, Caitlin Berrigan is currently a control engineer on the, Vel on the Bell uh, V280 program uh, at Bell Textron. Her duties include time and frequency domain analysis, safety of flight uh, test data monitoring on uh, aircraft uh, flight control support, open and closed loop software testing uh, in support of the V280. Uh, prior to that, uh, she was at Textron Aviation as a mechanical uh, uh, systems engineer on the Citation Longitude uh, high lift system and in the flight controls uh, unit. Kate Inton has her master's degree, as was mentioned, 
uh, from Georgia Tech. Uh, Dr. Mark Lopez uh, is an aerospace engineer uh, with the uh, U.S. Army uh, uh, DEVCOM um, Avmic Center at Moffett Field. Um, he leads uh, our efforts uh, in the area of flight mechanics, modeling, and simulation, uh, including physics-based modeling and system identification. Uh, he currently leads flight mechanics efforts uh, on future vertical lift-related configurations uh, for both manned and unmanned vehicles. Uh, prior to joining our lab, he received uh, his PhD uh, in 2016 with Georgia Tech uh, in aerospace engineering uh, with his work uh, on uh, rotorcraft integrated flight and vibration control uh, under uh, Dr. Prasad and, uh, and uh, his current interests are in the area of modeling uh, FVL configurations and uh, Group 3 UAS um, uh, for less mile assured resupply. Um, this is a, a, a really unique, uh, uh, this, this collaboration has really been a, a unique opportunity. Um, we um, advanced the, the uh, joint input output method as you'll be hearing about for highly correlated uh, control inputs originally on uh, the AFDF-16 and, and, uh, uh, and on the uh, um, uh, Learjet uh, in programs with Cessna and then had the opportunity uh, to apply it and work uh, uh, in understanding uh, the uh, flight dynamics control of the, of the Bell V280. So it's a, it's a great example of uh, cross-fertilization and, uh, and, uh, and what comes out of a really great uh, government industry collaboration. So with that, um, Caitlin and, and Mark, um, uh, we look forward to your presentation. Um, thank you. And Chris, do I have control of everything now? Uh, yes, you do. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, so thank you for all the great uh, introductions. And also thank you to all the attendees for um, coming to listen to our presentation this evening. This work, uh, as it's been stated, has been as a large focus on the application of our methodologies to allow for model identification with uh, respect to contributions from individual redundant control factors for the V280 in a hover configuration. Sorry, I'm just getting control of the mouse to how to, there's a bit of a delay. Um, it doesn't seem to like that slide. Okay. Um, so anyway, I'll just say, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that this was, as Dr. Schischler said, a large co co cooperative effort between Bell Army and Georgia Tech. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the other co-authors for this paper, which are, um, Mr. Paul Ruckel from Bell and Dr. J.B.R. Prasad from Georgia Tech. System identification has been a long recognized important part of our control law development process. Implementing SysID in the early flight testing can reduce control law development risks and costs associated with in-flight optimization and handling qualities testing. SysID methods are also extremely valuable in trying to improve the correlation between our flight test data and our uh, um, physics-based flight dynamics models. So some quick background on the system identification, just a standard direct approach. The identification process will start with either simulation or flight testing, so which is then used to turn our closed, obtain a closed loop uh, result, um, which is then used to determine the effect of a bare airframe frequency response. The simplest uh, SysID application would be for a single input, single output, or CISO system. However, most modern aerospace applications will often require the identification of multi-input, multi-output, or MIMO systems. So in these cases, our traditional direct methods of SysID will work well with the partially co correlated inputs. However, they will start to break down um, with, four, with fully correlated inputs. 
and to talk a little bit more on that, um, Mark is going to give us some background. I'm trying to advance the slide, but it's not letting me. Did I lose control? Uh, just very briefly. My apologies. Okay. Mark, you're up. All right. Uh, thanks, Caitlin. Um, so a quick uh, background on on the uh, joint input output um, uh, method is, has been mentioned a few times already. Um, so the with the advance of all these modern configurations in, in Rotocraft, um, there's been a, a lot of need for new um, sophisticated system identification methods um, because of these uh, multiple control effectors. Um, and so this has been uh, really kind of pushed um, from uh, 2019 from Tom Berger. Um, and the, the reason that this occurs is because you can have, as, as Caitlin mentioned, you can have um, highly correlated control effector inputs. Um, and this can happen for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, first you could um, have uh, off-axis control inputs, um, which are fed back through the control system um, and then correlated with some of the primary control inputs. Um, <clears throat> If it's a closed loop system, that, that correlation can be uh, very high. Um, and then similarly, if you have multiple control effectors, um, you might have a, a mechanical mixer, which takes a pilot input and, and attributes it to multiple control effectors. Um, and then if you have uh, uh, an advanced configuration, such as the V280, uh, you'll actually have uh, multiple redundant control effectors in, in any particular axis. Um, and so kind of by default, um, any channel inputs are going to be highly correlated. Um, and then the the way that we'll address this is uh, using the join input output method, uh, which has been a, a new um, advancement in system ID efforts, um, as a, this new method will be able to identify some of the control effectiveness um, for individual control effectors. Um, you can see some of the examples on the bottom of chart five. Um, so as, as Mark Tischer mentioned, one of the first flight dynamics applications of the joint input output method uh, was the F-16 Vista by uh, Marat Knapp in 2018. Um, back in 2019, um, I uh, had developed a, had used this method to develop um, models for um, for multi-copters where the individual control effectors for each individual rotor were identified. And of course, um, this work is is talking about the V280. And so the real objective of, of this work that we're presenting here today um, really is to develop and demonstrate the JIO method, um, both in the V280 cell, the system integration lab, um, which is a, a controlled environment. Um, so, so we can evaluate how the actual methodology works in, in a real rotorcraft, um, and then proceed on to flight testing and, and show its effectiveness there. Uh, can we move to the next chart, Kaylin? Chart six. Uh, there we go, thanks. Okay, I think we're on chart six. So um, a little bit of background on what the join input output method is. Um, <clears throat> it's 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 got a lot of ties from uh, from even previous uh, before what's listed, but the the kind of main uh, contribution to to the join input output method was really a proposal by a kike in 1967, uh, where he first used this methodology or what becomes this methodology as a way to uh, mitigate noise correlation when you have a closed loop uh, feedback system. Um, it was further developed uh, by, by Brett Hauer um, in connecting some of the, the uh, spectral methods versus frequency domain methods. Um, and since then, since the 60s, it's kind of been used primarily for that purpose of addressing uh, noise issues. Um, back in 2017, uh, Generetti had kind of stumbled upon this method um, and realized that this is actually much more powerful than just addressing noise correlation. Um, and Generetti and Hersey, both uh, independent or uh, um, with two different studies, um, had used the join up put output method to actually identify um, uh, rotorcraft inflow models where you have um, the, the forcing functions for the inflow models uh, being completely highly correlated um, when, for example, you give a swashplate input. Um, as I've kind of, kind of already mentioned, um, you know, we, we saw, uh, AVMIC saw some of these um, applications for uh, rotorcraft inflow identification and realized that they could be um, 
they could solve one of the main issues that we have in uh, in actual flight mechanics, uh, flight dynamics identification. Um, and so in, in 2018, uh, Marit uh, Knapp had uh, applied the methodology to the Vista F-16 for, for a fixed wing um, uh, identification. Um, and then as, as Mark Tischler had mentioned, uh, Tom Berger had then taken that and applied the, the same methodology to the Learjet LJ-25D um, to get a, a very comprehensive study on uh, how the methodology is actually working. Um, I've already mentioned uh, the application for for, or for UAS. Um, and then uh, earlier this year, um, uh, Caitlin and uh, I had presented uh, some of the uh, V280 SIL efforts um, at the UAS handling or at the um, uh, rotorcraft handling qualities meeting, um, and we'll we'll cover a little bit of that today as well. Um, but the the main thing that I want to emphasize here <clears throat> is that a lot of this work uh, has already proven that the JO method um, is correct and identifies correctly the the systems with highly correlated inputs. Um, so for for this paper for this work, we're not looking at um, developing the methodology per se, but rather we're, we're showing its application to the V280 and, and what the um, different uh, lessons learned are for actual man-sized rotorcraft and high-fidelity simulation. Chart seven, please. Okay, um, so what is the joint of methodology and, and how does it actually work? Um, when we have a normal identification process, um, we consider one input to or, or one input to uh, multiple outputs. Um, and so, if you if you look at the uh, block diagram here, um, you know perhaps the the pilot might give a stick inceptor input, um, a frequency sweep usually, and that'll go through the control system, the feed forward, the mixer, and then that'll result in the um, the actual control effectors that go into the bare frame. Uh, vehicle, so that that's listed as delta A in uh, in red, um, and then of course the control effectors, you know, move the actual uh, strategy uh, forces and moments on the on the bear frame, which result in you know, for example, roll moments and, and pitch moments and roll rate response and pitch rate response, etc. And those are referred to as the uh, bear frame outputs in Y. Um, so normally, you know, we for a standard system ID, we consider the response from Y uh, due to delta A. Um, but of course, the, the issue with redundant control factors is, is that there's multiple delta A's and they're all highly correlated. And this has been a historical problem for system identification methods. Um, but on the, on the other hand, these bare frame outputs wise, um, you can have multiple uh, um, highly correlated outputs and there's no issue with that. So what we'll do for the, for the joint input output methodology is actually we'll compute the um, frequency responses of delta A and Y, and we'll treat them both as outputs with respect to an intermediate uh, reference reference input, which we'll just refer to as, as ref. Um, so you can see on the bottom of, of chart eight, um, we're actually, what we're doing is we're taking the, the thing that we're interested in, Y to delta A, the, the bare airframe response, and we're breaking it up into two different matrix frequency response matrices. One is the reference to output matrix. So again, that's the actual outputs, uh, measured outputs due to a particular reference input. And then the actual highly correlated um, control effectors delta A due to the, again, the, the um, reference input. And, and I just want to emphasize that these are all uh, matrices. Um, so so we'll, I'll talk about that in, in the next chart. Um, once we compete these two frequency response matrices, um, as shown in, in the actual equation, um, we'll take the inverse of the reference to effector matrix and then uh, pre-multiply it with the reference to output matrix, and that'll give us the effector to output matrix that we're actually interested in. Chart nine, please. So, okay. Um, so, you know, I've, I've kind of mentioned how this all works, um, but there's, you know, there's a, a couple key things to, to really take away that I don't want you to, to miss out on. Um, one is that, you know, I've, I mentioned that the, the whole premise behind this um, is that in the direct method, uh, the normal traditional system ID method, um, we can have outputs that are fully correlated. Um, and so essentially we're just jointly computing frequency responses by treating the inputs and outputs both as outputs, which is why, why it's referred to as the joint input output method. Um, and kind of with that view, you can really just see the join input output method is just a, a post-processing extension of the direct method, essentially breaking it into a two-step computation. 
Um, now you might look at the the actual equation and and it's kind of written simply with in matrix form, um, but you can simplify it a little bit further if you think of just the single input, single output, or, or CISO case. And really, if you just look at it, um, it's essentially just a chain rule expansion um, using that intermediary reference input. Um, so, so that helps to kind of simplify and, and understand what's going on here. Um, now, I've mentioned these reference inputs, but I haven't really mentioned what they are yet. Um, and the the way we'll simplify this is by essentially choosing our reference input as a as our actual um, engineering test command or our, our frequency sweep signal. So, for example, if the pilot gives in a, a, a sweep at the stick inceptor, that will for that time history that will be considered the reference input. Um, or if we directly inject an actuator or, or effector um, sweep for that time history, we'll consider that the reference signal. Um, and then one last uh, tidbit is that this, this methodology, while it's very complex, um, it's a lot of bookkeeping. Um, it's all been integrated natively into uh, AvMix tool Cypher um, so that a lot of the community, in, including Bell and, and others, um, can access this tool and, and use this very powerful methodolo methodology. Uh, let's move on to chart 10. Caitlin? Thank you, Mark. Um, so the so the V280 is Bell's next generation tilt rotor, which is designed for the future long-range assault aircraft program of record. In the past 36 months, Team Valor has um, accrued over 180 hours of successful flight time and over 336 um, operating hours. They've also exceeded over 300 knots airspeed. Um, 280 is comprised of two horizontally fixed engines. Uh, two uh, horizontally fixed engines on the wingtips, while the rotor pylons are free to actually to allow for a vertical takeoff and landing, which is our VTOL mode, hover, and then forward flight, a cruise mode. The 280 control system is overall a uh, well harmonized and um, full of redundant control effectors that are used for a very large portion of the flight envelope. So just a quick basics on tilt rotor controls. Um, in VTOL configuration, the aircraft uses a combination of our rotor collective and cyclic inputs for control authority. As the, the vehicle transitions, um, or also known as conversion mode, into a cruise forward flight configuration, Control now will transition to a more flap around rudder vader uh, traditional base. So when looking for coupled effectors for the a tilt rotor in hover, the um, in, an, in the VTOL configure um, and a hover, a lateral control is the best example of redundant control allocation. So for our vehicle, when the pilot's um, lateral stick displacement uh, like move this stick, it will result in both a symmetric collective and a lateral cyclic input. So, um, as I was saying, when the pilot commands a roll, the displacement results in both uh, differential collective DCP and lateral cyclic input at both of our rotor heads. Our proportions of DCP and lateral cyclic are determined by a fixed ratio of control allocation that's based on the pilot's lateral stick displacement. So for in our hover mode, the 280 control laws are always going to command both DCP and lat cyclic, which means they'll always be fully correlated. And thus we have a, a problem when trying to identify the um, control power of each of the effectors. So for the analysis that we're going to look at today, we um, performed flight testing that was done at the Flight Research Center here in Arlington, Texas. Our flight conditions uh, for testing were limited to a smooth air condition, so you have total um, winds less than 10 knots, um, smooth air, and the goal is to reduce uh, the influence of unmeasurable inputs. And um, we were also able to monitor our data collection using some near real-time tools uh, to ensure our quality. In flight tests, the frequency sweeps were performed in three different ways. The first being a manual piloted sweep at the stick inceptor. The, from the plot on the right here, the, the sweep command at the inceptor is in blue 
and then the two control factor signals, DCP and lateral cyclic respectively, um, are shown in red, and then the aircraft roll rate response is shown in green. And you can see on the left with the block diagram, corresponding to the what Mark just talked about, um, we are using the stick conceptor sweep as our reference. The next form of sweep that we did was um, an automated sweep at the inceptor. Um, so this is using like the engineering test commands um, using a tablet. Um, and so here, once again, the uh, lateral um, stick sweep uh, is um, in the blue, and then you have your effector responses in um, red and then roll rate in green. And here, this also um, symbolizes uh, kind of like what you would routinely, routinely do for system identification procedures. Um, so as I was kind of saying earlier, you have your delta S now, which is going to go, um, is be allocated directly through C um, to both DCP and LAT cyclic. So somehow we need to separate this out as Mark had discussed. Um, and you can see from the time history that the effectors are completely correlated looking at the two um, effector responses. So to solve this problem, we have our second reference uh, signal, which is also the third form of sweep we did, and that is directly at the effector um, using the engineering commands. So uh, here, once again, you can see we have a high correlation between lat cyclic and DCP, as we would expect, but now we have our inceptor sweep going directly um, into sorry, not inceptor. Uh, we have our effector sweep going directly into DCP. Um, so uh, that um, both of the so that both the lateral um, um, the incept, so the effector sweep. So that um, basically what you end up seeing is that um, this P block here is going to respond from our H, which is the feedback. Um, and then thus it's going to get allocated through C that way. Um, thus DCP and lat cyclic um, are still completely correlated, but we have a way to separate it out now. So throughout all of this, we've been talking about looking at the time histories and the correlation um, that you can see visually, but there is also a way to look at this in a more quantitative aspect. Um, which would be looking at the cross-control coherence. So we looked uh, at it this quantitatively, um, looking at the lateral cyclic to DCP coherence. And it was found that the cross-control coherence for both the lateral inceptor sweeps and the DCP effector sweeps um, is nearly one for the majority of our identified frequency range. So from Tischler's uh, work, it's indicated that if your um, MIMO conditioning using our direct method, as we've discussed, can accurately extract frequency response um, information when our cross-control coherence is less than a half. However, for our case, we've found that it's one, um, so that indicates quantitatively that DCP and lat cyclic are completely correlated. And then to the right, just to show again, we have um, the time histories and you can see how they line up uh, perfectly. So, from this, um, from this work, we uh, decided to calculate the frequency responses using the two different methods, using first the single input, single output method, and then also using the joint input, joint output method. Um, so you can see here, uh, it's looking at DCP to roll rate response first. We have um, the JIO in blue, and then the CISO in orange. And they're pretty much magnitude-wise right on top of each other, which um, for our just knowing um, historically, we would expect DCP to be a fairly long, large con contributor um, in the lateral axis. Now, where it gets interesting is looking at the differences between the CISO calculation of lateral cyclic and of the JIO. 
which is green. So you can see here, now the JIO shows a much lower um, contribution to the role effectiveness um, versus if you were to go with the CISO input. So overall, looking at this, our DCP, there's not the biggest difference if you were to use JIO versus CISO, both methods would be adequate. However, looking at our lateral cyclic, um, response. So it's quite a sizable difference and it's much, it's more accurate or around what more we'd expect um, with the JO calculation. So the, um, we also did performed a comparison of our flight test data and our SIL work that we had done um, back in February. So the using here, you're seeing the JIO um, approximation methods for both DCP and lateral cyclic. And blue is our SIL data, and the red dashed line is our flight test data. And as you can see, we have a pretty good match for um, the two for both of them, which gives us confidence in our modeling, as well as confidence um, in using the method. So the goal of this is of system identification, and so you're trying to identify your control effectiveness and your derivatives. So um, to get to this, we started out with um, determining the transfer function identification. So we used um, initially uh, on the top line, you see we used a low order second over third transfer function for roll rate that we derived in terms of our stability and control derivatives and also accounted for our higher order rotor inflow dynamics. The delta in this equation is the control effector. So in our case, that would be either DCP or lateral cyclic and the roll moment due to the effector is our associated roll control derivative. Overall, this equation just provided us with an approximation. Approximation, the, the full identification of the actual derivatives is going to require a lot more uh, considerations and can't be taken from this. So we needed to create a simpler approximation to obtain our control derivative directly. We made a general assumption or a general high frequency um, assumption that said that we, uh, the frequency range that we are specifically interested in and are identifying corresponds only to control derivatives that are, um, that all other derivatives and dynamic modes are act at sufficiently low enough frequencies and then they can be neglected. So with making that assumption, we end up with the transfer function in red, which is uh, more of a simple K over S or zero over first approximation. So looking at the plot, oops. Um, looking at the plot to the right, you can see the roll rate response, which is what's interesting um, the role response to change in dcp so our blue line is the jio identified frequency response and our red dashed line is the identified transfer function approximation the transfer function ids identified on the basis of only high frequency portions of the frequency sweep um, and are of what's of interest to us and if you can see we have an excellent agreement to the flight test data um, and overall the cost function of this is less than 50 and that's what we were using as our um as our uh, identifier for we're on the right track a similar exercise for this was also completed um, for lateral cyclic and can be found in our paper um, and once again we had an excellent agreement so now that we we identified our transfer function we were able to pull out our role control effectiveness. We have a comparison now between our flight test data and our SIL data. So for um, the role control derivatives, the effectiveness as kind of shown earlier was obtained by computing a ratio of roll rate responses due to the change in uh, DCP and roll rate responses due to our changes in lat cyclic. For DCP, the control effectiveness from both the identified results um, are in good agreement with the with our model um, here. The comparison for lateral cyclic um, will show that we are 
also in good agreement with our with our SIL data. Um, so overall, we have good confidence in our model that we're using. So in conclusion, for tilt orders such as our Bell V280 and flight conditions that we have highly correlated effectors, a uh, more sophisticated system identification post-processing method um, is required to determine our control effect uh, effectiveness for each effector. From this work, it was determined that the JIOs um, is adequate for this type of analysis um, and also should be considered as just an extension of the direct method, not a completely new method that's being proposed. We are also able to validate the 280 SIL against our flight test data, which gives us confidence that we're accurately capturing our control effectiveness. And we also determined that in order to minimize our flight test time, you will only need to sweep one of the correlated effectors um, per axis along with your inceptor sweep. And then once again, this joint uh, project success is due to the efforts and support of many contributors. Um, and we would specifically like to thank the 280 team, the uh, DEVCOM, AVMIC, I guess, and then pilots, and then our pilots from Bell who spent hours flying in the sill, practicing, and then actually performing the sweeps and flight test in a safe manner. And that's all. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Caitlin and uh, Dr. Lopez. Uh, very much enjoyed that presentation. Uh, looking at the question board at this point, I don't know that I see any questions. Are there any from the uh, uh, attendees this evening? I'll, I guess I'll start off with one. This is Mark Tischler. Um, for the for the uh, interest of the audience, you focused on the identification uh, and the special effort to separate out uh, the identification of the of the uh, control derivatives for the individual effectors. Um, Mark, um, and I know that you're working on this. Um, I think it would be interesting for the audience. Uh, how do you how do you complete the uh, the the identification model? So. There, there's there's uh, control derivatives, but there are also stability derivatives. Do you do you do, would you use the same uh, 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 types of special inputs for that and special methods, or what? Uh, how do you get the how do you get the traditional stability derivatives once you separate it out the V matrix control derivatives uh, using this method? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, Mark Lopez here. So the you know, the joint input output method and the frequency responses that we identified, um, really the primary thing that we're getting from that are the control derivatives or the control effectiveness for individual uh, control effectors. Um, there's no, you know, for for however many years, uh, you know, you've been working on uh, system identification, I think since, uh, since the 80s, um, you know, you've, your direct methods have been able to produce um, identification results from the, the um, mixer input, um, which obviously, you know, includes um, the actual dynamic response of the vehicle and the control derivatives. And so there's no issue with using uh, those same um, uh, mixer input frequency responses um, to actually identify the, the system dynamics, the control derivative, the, sorry, the uh, stability derivatives, because those don't change whether you're using one control input or another uh, control effector. Um, and so the way that we'd actually go about this, um, and, and we're um, submitting an, an abstract to the upcoming forum on this, is actually combining um, both uh, standard uh, direct method identification uh, frequency sweeps, um, which have uh, very good uh, quality across the entire frequency range. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, which, which buys you the, the stability derivatives, and then using the methods that, that Kayla and I have presented here, specifically to get those uh, st those uh, control derivatives for the individual control effectors and then using all those all that data combined together in a uh, multi input multi output identification we get you the full um, state space model with all control inputs or with all uh, control derivatives stability derivatives and any effective time delays thanks for the question mark
yeah that's 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 very illuminating uh, uh i guess i guess another way of saying it perhaps is uh, uh if you're looking for the the roll damping derivative lp however as long as you can generate a good a good roll rate it doesn't really matter uh what uh, uh what control effector you use to get there and so using right. the most using the mixer input will will get you a very strong a very strong response and so why not use that one right exactly So oh, looks like uh, Dr. Tischler was able to prime the pump, so to speak. So we got a, had a few questions come in. Uh, looks like our first question was from David Downey. And uh, his question is, are there any lessons learned uh, from the efforts? Um. I guess I'll answer that. I think there's been quite a few lessons learned um, that I'm sure Mark would agree with from just how do we actually implement this testing um, into our flight test program to all the way with we have, as uh, Mark Tischler uh, hinted at, um, worked through the state space model um, identification and when to use the JO method, when not to use the JO method, when you're trying to determine cer certain um, derivatives. Dr. Lopez, did you have any other uh, additions yeah. to that? Um, I, I just want to emphasize one of the lessons learned on, which is I think is the last conclusion on, on the co conclusion side, um, was the the need to only have one additional sweep uh, frequency sweep input um, because at the onset of this um, you know we had we kind of had ideas of of how many um, engineering test commands and in, in you know runs do we need um, but it wasn't quite clear whether or not we could use um, you know combine as Caitlin showed uh, the piloted sweeps with the uh, direct effector sweeps um, because in, in a lot of the prior work um, pretty much you had uh, only seen just the direct effector sweeps. Um, and so by doing that, you're, you're saving a lot of flight test time and of course a lot of flight test uh, um, hours and, and costs associated with that um, and, and effort. Um, and I think that's probably one of the, the biggest takeaways um, in terms of uh, pushing forward uh, for, for other applications um, in terms of lessons learned. Okay, thank you. Uh, Looks like our next question here, or, and uh, preceded by a comment, is from uh, Paul Wittick. Uh, first off, uh, Paul says, excellent presentation. And then his question is, uh, do your calculations incorporate wind gusts during test flights? So as I, I stated in the presentation, we um, limit our wind conditions to under 10 knots and we have to have smooth air so the so that the wind so we it's hard to measure and account for those um, gusts so we wouldn't fly in those conditions um, so we're kind of using it as a no factor um, I'll add that uh, Caitlin had shown the frequency responses which all had very good coherence uh, close to one um, and if there were turbulence or gusts or, or anything like that um, you'd see a degradation in coherence and the coherence dropped down. Um, so the, the fact that we have very good coherence throughout the entire frequency range indicates that we have a, a good identification um, with, with the quality results um, and whether or not there was turbulence or gusts during the, the process um, the, the, or during the actual flight testing, the results um, are, are very high quality. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Erasmo Pinheiro. Uh, his question is for Dr. Lopez. Can this method be applied to a manned or unmanned full-size air taxi with multi-rotors? I uh, wonder if uh, Erasmo is hinting at something there. Um, or is it uh, too complex to deal with that? Uh, that's that's a great question, Erasmo, um, and I appreciate the question. Um, the so as I mentioned, one of the the um, applications from 2019 was on multi-copters, 
Um, and of course, multi-copters, you know, on the on the small UAS scale, aren't too far of a step away from larger EV tall, um, that type of configuration. Um, so as as long as you can um, affect uh, each of the you know, control each of the individual control effectors, um, and and measure, you know, in with the, with the good conditions and high accuracy for your, for your measurements, um, there there shouldn't be any issues. Um, and there there um i guess there there isn't any specific work on uh, evtol um because there there aren't a lot of them um flying um but i, I suspect that if you uh, were to do something like this on uh, on some of the uh, prototypes uh, that are flying um that you'd get a lot of um good results from them in being able to contribute calculate the uh, individual uh, contributions from control effectors Mark, just to just to uh, uh, publicize a little bit your work on the octocopter, uh, uh, which I think does have uh, a significant bearing on a number of the UAM configurations, uh, in which you showed using the JO method that as the as the rotor systems started to come closer together, space and space wise, uh, that they're uh, that their effective, uh, their control effectiveness uh, actually uh, drops. And uh, in the case of the uh, octocopter, you actually saw a drop of around 30% in terms of control effectiveness. Uh, and so there's, uh, uh, as compared to, um, uh, as compared to the, um, to, the to, to a quadcopter. So some of these configurations that have the, the rotors uh, very tightly packed together uh, may uh, uh, seem to have uh, mutual interference effects that uh, uh, so so there's bearing in that sense uh, would, wouldn't you say yeah absolutely um, you know the that was one of the most significant results from uh, that work in 2019 um, and there's in in the VTOL you know world obviously there's a lot of interest in what are the interactional aerodynamics um, and I think that by being able to use this methodology um, that that Caitlin shown, Caitlin and I have shown. Um, you know, you'll be able to demonstrate in in flight um, whether or not those international aerodynamics for eVTOL um, are a concern or not. Um, and I, obviously, that would be very configuration dependent. Okay, thank you. Our uh, next question here is from Lane Merritt. Lane asks. Uh, um, it says, uh, you mentioned saving uh, flight test time by using system identification. Do you have a figure that you cite for flight time saved over typical methods? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Certainly. So his question is, uh, do you have a figure that you cite for flight time saved over typical methods. And this is in regards to your comments uh, mentioned about saving flight test time uh, through the use of system identification. Um, so uh, with regards to saving time using just one effector sweep versus two effector sweeps and an inceptor sweep, we don't actually have an exact um, flight test like number or figure um, but we because we tried it out in the sill first and kind of determined that this was the good approach for us so we never we haven't actually done the full um, time uh, in there yeah I mean I, I guess we haven't um, in in flight testing it hasn't been done um, but if you just look at the number of of types of frequency sweeps and test commands that you need you're talking about um three which you would need um versus two um in in the methodology that we're showing where you're kind of combining the the stick inputs with the indirect inceptor inputs and so i mean just from the number of sweeps um, you're talking a, a savings of 30 percent or so yeah because why you do like two or three sweeps per effector or inceptor. Um, and then we have, like I, I kind of mentioned, we have a tool so that we can see real time what our coherence is and to make sure that the data quality we're getting, which 
is also when we're looking, you know, did we have a gust and our coherence dropped, as Mark had said. Um, so if anything happens and you have to repeat that, which does happen, usually you need more, um, that's all adding to time and air. Okay, um, inadvertently resized my uh, question box here, so I apologize. Get it back into view. There we go. Um, the next question is from uh, Brad Roberts. Brad asks, what is the physical explanation for the gain reduction on lateral cyclic when using JIO? Is it accounting for the change in control power derivative with time from flapping with roll rate? Sorry, could you repeat that last uh, portion of the question, George? Sure. Is it accounting for what? Yeah, is it accounting for the change? So I'll start from the beginning. Uh, so he, he asks, what, what is the physical explanation for the gain reduction on lateral cyclic when using JIO? And then he asks, is it accounting for the change in control power derivative with time from flapping with roll rate. I'm not sure that I completely understand the last portion of the question, um, but the essentially. I think, I, think you know, I understand the last portion. I don't think so. Um, just knowing the setup, Brad. Um, so I, I don't believe it um, is doing that. Like the, um, it's just, it's an over, so if you were to do just the single, the CISO method, it's an, you're getting an over um, inflation of what that gain is because it's got everything lumped together. Where with your, when you separate out the DCP and lateral cyclic um, input, separate inputs, that's going to decrease your gain. And then Mark, if you had an answer for like the first part. No, I, I completely agree. Like when you when you do the CISO assumption, you're essentially um, taking what all the things that you're ignoring. So that would be DCP, and you're adding that into the lateral cyclic response that you're identifying um, because you're ignoring it, right? Um, and so so actually that's why that um, frequency responses is, is significantly higher uh, because in, it's essentially counting both contributions um, as one one factor. Um, you're, you're making the wrong assumption is right. what's going on. Your initial assumption and your initial like guess that we're putting in here is, is not correct. Um, so that's why. Okay, then um, I think our what, Appears to be our last question is another one from Brad Roberts, and he asks, how does the JIO method improve a nonlinear model? So um, I'll, I'll say from, from my experience, for any particular flight condition, um, so, so for this example, obviously it's hover, um, you you have your nonlinear model, but for that particular condition, the model the the vehicle behaves very linearly. Um, results, you know, over the last 40 years have shown that even though you have um, you know on the small scale nonlinear interactions, um, when you look at the gross vehicle flight dynamics for a particular flight condition, they behave very linearly, which is shown by the high coherence. Um, and so when you have that high coherence, it shows both uh, high linearity as well as high quality. Um, and so with regards to the actual question, you'd, you'd use this method to validate your nonlinear model um, for a particular flight condition, and then obviously repeat the same process for, for which your um, flight conditions would change your actual linear model. 
Um, so for example, for the V280, you might repeat it in, in hover and then a, a transition uh, regime and then you know, a cruise uh, regime or something like that. And then adjust your nonlinear model uh, to, to kind of identify and, and match the flight test results for all of those. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark. So again, since this is our first, we're gonna experiment a little bit with the attendees. So I think at this time, we're going to uh, try to open the audio lines. So with that, uh, I think Mr. Chris will open it and we can attempt to uh, answer any uh, uh, questions over, over the... Um, audio connection. We're having a bit of an issue unmuting here. Dr. Lopez, this is Erasmo Piñero. Can you hear me okay, sir? Great, I, I can, can hear, hear you. I can hear you, at Erasmo, if uh, George speaking. Uh, looks like Dr. Or Lopez can hear you. I'm not sure if his audio is... Yeah, yeah he can hear me, but I don't think we can hear him. But let me ask the question anyway. So, Dr. Lopez, on... Um, uh, my question has to do with the, the future of this methodology. Uh, and the past a little bit, the F-16 AFT, um, do you know what they did with, in that particular aircraft and how did it apply to what you guys did uh, in this particular effort? Uh, you basically couldn't use any of that uh, good work that NASA did or was it instrumental in what you did for the V-280. I just want to know what the difference is between a fixed wing aircraft and a, and a V-stall aircraft like the V-280. What are the, the differences yeah. that made the, the F-16 AFT too remote for you guys not to be able to use it? Or perhaps you did use it a lot. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll mention that um, during the, the 2018 um, study by Mart Knapp with the F-16 uh, Vista, um, you know, she had demonstrated this methodology for it, um, and she had looked at um, the the sweeps from individual control effectors. So um, I think it was a flapper on and and um, and uh, an uh, aileron or, or something like that. Um, where you, you do have redundancy in the control surfaces. The one big difference between um, the V280 and and uh, and any fixed wing vehicle, um, particularly in hover, is just the the traditional issues that you see in rotocraft, which is that rotocraft um, you know tend to be much more noisy compared to to fixed wing vehicles um, in in the hover configuration. Um, and so you you have issues of signal to noise um, versus in a fixed wing vehicle where you have lots of you know dynamic dynamic pressure and you can generate huge moments. Um, you have very clean signals, um, and so it's very easy to use those direct effector sweeps um, and not have any issues um, of of you know signal degradation or or you know signal to noise issues. Um, and and so I. I that's one of the key differences between, um, you know, the V280 work, which is, you know, a rotorcraft in retail mode versus a fixed wing vehicle. Um, and that's probably one of the primary differences in, in terms of applying the method. Well, thank you very much to uh, both of you. What a great uh, advancement. Thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Appreciate the question and the feedback. <clears throat> Okay, hey, um, if there's no other uh, real-time questions from the audience. Oh, looks like we did have uh, one hit the discussion board here. Uh, so Paul Wittick asks, do the calculations degrade at high 
forward speed. Um, no, I wouldn't expect that to be a factor. Okay, thank you. Hey, George, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, Brad. Oh, okay, it works. <laughs> uh, sorry, at the risk of uh, my question was hard to write. Um, I'll try to clarify a little bit if I can take a second here. So, so in our hover, you know, we kind of attribute, I'll say, 20% of our roll control power to the lateral cyclic. Um, and that's true from a linear derivative instantaneous thing. But what I was getting at is in time domain, we see that, yes, you get the swash plate. And initially, you get the flapping but it starts to wash away as soon as the roll rate gets started from uh, the inflow and, and, and the flapping. So I was, what I was wondering was, is your GIO input separating that out so that you are effectively capturing the reduction in gain uh, over a short period of time. I see. Is, Thanks for the question, get Brad. The question a little better now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so basically, you're saying the contribution of the actual um, control input itself versus the contribution from the flapping to roll rate response. Um, th that's how I'm understanding the question. And so, the the way that um, I've seen things in in in, uh, in the flight dynamics models and, and how they break down is that you know you have your flap response which is at a high frequency um, and you know obviously past so if you if you look at the frequency response um, it's essentially in the order it's in backwards time order so at high frequency is the things that happen very fast um, and so you have your rotor modes which are at, at some high frequency and then past those rotor modes are the actual um, direct transmission terms um, from the actual control effector itself. Um, now, to, to answer your question, um, you know, for for the data presented here, um, you know, there's no clear indication that you know there's a, a rotor mode anywhere, um, you know, because it's it's very flat, and so whatever it is that's being identified. Um, Includes the the rotor contribution, the rotor flap contribution uh, to it, um, because otherwise you'd see uh, an actual mode in the frequency response data. Um, so so no, we haven't. For the results presented, uh, it doesn't appear that they've been separated out. Um, you, if you had a vehicle which had a distinct rotor mode in it, um, where you could see that, then I'd suspect that you would be able to identify the differences between those. Um, but for the data presented, it, it doesn't look like that's the case. Does that answer your question, Brad? Yes, it does. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. That's good. Okay. Well, uh, so with that, I think uh, we've kind of timed it perfectly here. So uh, right at uh, about an hour. So uh, with that, Chris, you can go ahead and just mute all the participants and I'll just uh, uh, conclude by saying, um, you know, thank you again for, for everyone's participation. I did want to uh, specifically uh, uh, acknowledge, I, I noticed uh, attendance by Harry Nahatis, who's the president of the East New England chapter. And so um, uh, Harry was willing to, uh, uh, take a phone call with me a couple months back to kind of uh, share lessons learned uh, from his uh, experience and his chapter's experience as kind of the pioneers here in hosting uh, uh, chapter events by way of webinar during the pandemic. So uh, appreciate you sharing that. And, uh, you know, thank you, Harry, for really enabling um, the Southwest chapter uh, to be successful here this evening. So again, with that, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Caitlin, 
thank you, Dr. Lopez, uh, Dr. Uh, Tischler, and to uh, Carl and Elizabeth, uh, and again to uh, the VFS uh, National, Jim and, and Chris, for all your support. And uh, we look forward to uh, future events with you all. So with that, uh, goodbye and good night.